All righty, it's seven o'clock, so we'll get started. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the SSAT's annual webinar on high yield topics for the Absite 2021. This is part one of our series. We'll have part two coming up next week. Um, and so my name is Naomi Sell, and I'll be moderating today's session. Now, this webinar is not meant to be your only source um, for the Absite, but rather a quick recap of some high yield topics um, for the test that's scaringly only three weeks away from today. Um, but kind of before we get going, we have some webinar tips. Um, and so for those of you joining, we'll have you kind of mute your microphone. Um, and uh, in terms of questions, we have a question and answer feature at the bottom, which we'll, I'll be able to filter through those as we go. Uh, for the most part, I'll be saving the majority of questions to the end of the session so that we can get through all the content, which is why you're all here. Um, but um, if any questions are, are really pertinent to the moment, I'll see if we can kind of get those in at the time being. For, for those who, who maybe this is your first time hearing about the SSAT or, or joining one of our webinars, um, we're an association that was founded back in 1960. Originally, we were the Association for Colon Surgery. Um, and before we evolved into the SSAT. And our mission was to lead in advancing the science and practice of gastrointestinal surgery. And if you're interested, uh, we do have a lot of kind of activities that we do other than just these webinars. Um, and I really encourage a lot of you to, to join our membership. And, and I assume that most of you are residents out there. And um, as residents, uh, fortunately, the candidate membership is only $20. And there's, there's a lot of great perks that come with it. Um, the main benefits are you get a subscription to JOGS and also get all the great journal articles that come with it. Uh, you also get discounts for DDW, which our annual meeting is a part of. Um, and there's also a bunch of leadership, leadership opportunities, um, more specifically this education committee that a number of us here are on, um, as well as opportunities to apply for a bunch of awards and grants. Um, our annual meeting this year will be in May, of course, virtual kind of like everything that's going on. Um, and the other thing I'll plug is our residence corner where you can find other tools for absite studying, uh, most notably the absite quizzes um, and some other video library content and access to with these recordings that way that we are doing. Um, so for our speakers for tonight, this is, this is our crew. Um, and for the sake of time, we will dive right into things. Um, and so let's kick off the session with our first speaker. Um, that's Dr. Jacob Edwards from East Carolina University, and he'll be giving us some high yield facts on trauma and critical care. Um, so Dr. Edwards, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. Um, glad you all joined us tonight. I'm going to be covering trauma and critical care pretty quickly. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to be covering trauma and uh, via a um, region-based uh, approach and critical care via systems-based approach. So head trauma, um, they don't ask us necessarily how to or to calculate a GCS as, as part of an answer but usually you have to calculate it to get to an answer for treatment or for um, intervention. So one of these is indications for a head CT. Um, if you have a GCS that's depressed, it's an indication for getting a head CT in the trauma versus also penetrating. If you have physical exam findings of CSF from the nose or ears, hem hematipanum, um, or if the patient is altered due to drugs or alcohol, Typical images that they quiz us on is the epidural hematoma, which is this lentin, uh, lentiform uh, image up to the right of your screen. Um, this is due to the middle meningeal artery um, laceration. Uh, this has a period of loss of consciousness, then a lucid interval, and then uh, deter uh, clinical deterioration. Um, if they don't have deterioration, but have a midline shift greater than five millimeters, they uh, go to the OR for a craniectomy. A subdural hematoma is due to bridging veins being sheared. Uh, it's a shear force. This is operated on for midline shift greater than one centimeter. And then interventricular hemorrhage uh, leads to hydrocephalus due to clotting in the ventricles. Uh, 
Um, and this is relieved by a ventriculostomy. And then uh, DAI, uh, your more sensitive test is gonna be an MRI. Uh, this blossoms over time. So they typically get worse over time. Um, peak ICPs usually are reached between 48 and 72 hours after your injury. ICP monitors are placed based off brain trauma foundation guidelines. Um, so as you can see here, it's a GCS less than nine with an abnormal head CT, a normal head CT uh, with a GCS less than, uh, or with a, yeah, GCS less than nine and the patient is greater than 40 years old or posturing or having a persistent hypotension. Um, <clears throat> ICP management is for greater than uh, 22 millimeters of mercury. You obtain, um, this is to help obtain a goal of a CPP greater than 60. Uh, your interventions for doing this are listed here. Um, a lot of times they'll ask us about mannitol versus hypertonic saline. Um, typically you're gonna do the hypertonic saline in a patient who's a trauma patient because they're always fluid down. Mannitol causes diuresis. Um, but if it's significant enough, mannitol is usually a little bit faster acting. Uh, then other common associations they ask us about is um, identification of a basilar skull fracture. Uh, this is physical exam findings with direct kunai's and battle signs. The association here is also a facial nerve injury. Uh, this is usually at the um, uh, at the geniculate ganglion. And then uh, coagulopathy associated with brain injuries due to increased tissue factor release. Moving on to the neck, uh, the high yield portion of this slide is your C2 odontoid fractures, which ones are stable and unstable. So a type one uh, is stable, it's above the base of the odontoid. Type two is at the base, it's unstable, requires fusion and halo. Um, and a type three is extension from the base into the body. Um, again, this is unstable. If you have facet fractures, you should be concerned for cord injury um, with ligamentous disruption and should get an MRI. Surgi surgical decompression of a cord uh, is required for progressing neurosymptoms or if you have open fractures. Anterior neck, um, so historically we use the zones of the neck, however, moved away from that now. Uh, we perform interventions and further assessment based off the signs of bleeding, hard signs of bleeding, airway injury, um, or esophageal injury. So this is gonna be arterial bleeding from the neck wound, uh, expanding hematoma, persistent hypotension, despite re resuscitative efforts. Um, subcutaneous air, dysphagia, hemoptysis, um, or focal neurodeficits. If you have um, hard signs of bleeding, such as arterial bleeding and expanding hematoma, that goes straight to the OR for exploration. If you have dysphagia, um, you can get a CT to further evaluate whether there's a hematoma causing compression, or if you might have even have a esophageal injury. Esophageal injury, uh, is diagnosed with an EGD of barium swallow. You need to get both. It's, the sensitivity here is uh, greater by doing both. So if they give you the option of just EGD or just barium swallow or both, get both. Uh, contained injuries can be uh, observed. However, if they are not contained um, and it's small, you can close this primarily but leave drainage. If it's a larger defect, then this is gonna be wide drainage and antibiotics, antibiotics, antibiotics. Neck trauma, um, so tracheal or laryng uh, laryngeal injury, you're gonna perform a, you're gonna secure the airway. Uh, sometimes this requires a crike. Uh, if it does, then this goes straight to the OR to convert to a trach. Um, and if there's a thyroid injury, do not perform a thyroidectomy, um, just obtain hemostasis and drain it. Um, <clears throat> moving on to the chest. So we place chest tubes all the time. There are questions that are, when does this patient need to go to the OR? So if you have 1.5 liters out initially, 250 cc's per hour over three hours, or 2.5 liters out over 24 hours, 
or if the patient is persistently hypotensive and there are no other in injuries to explain that. And then if uh, drainage, high volume drainage persists after 48 hours, you have increased risk for um, fibrothorax, entrapment of the lung and infection of the uh, infected hematoma. Tracheal bronchial, bronchial injuries. Um, this, when you place a chest tube, they can actually get worsening oxygenation. Um, this is the only time you have an indication for clamping a chest tube. Um, the right side is more common for this to occur. Uh, you would want to attempt to main stem the left side um, for better ventilation. And then um, diagnosis is via bronch. And then you want to repair if there's a large air leak immediately or if there's respiratory compromise, or you can do a delayed repair if there's a persistent air leak for two weeks. Diaphragm injuries, left side's the most common, uh, typically characterized by a chest x-ray that shows air fluid level in the chest or a coiled uh, OG or NG in the chest. The operative approach, um, if it's upon diagnosis, uh, less than a week transdominal, if it's greater than a week transthoracic. You may need mesh if it's a large defect. Aortic transection, um, typically characterized by your apical capping or loss of um, your aortic knob and a widened mediastinum is associated with first and second rib fractures. Um, typical location is at your ligamentum arteriosum, uh, sometimes at the root of the aorta or at the diaphragmatic hiatus. You're gonna get a, it's usually found on a chest CT or CTA of the chest. Uh, the approach is a left thoracotomy. Uh, sometimes you have to put these on partial left heart bypass. And then if it's distal, sometimes you can do an endograph. Uh, the more life-threatening injuries though should be treated first. A lot of times the aortic transections are contained um, and can be treated in a more uh, delayed fashion with endografts. Your box injuries, uh, we should all know the um, borders of the box, which is clavicles falling down the uh, in line with the nipple to your xiphoid. Um, if you have injuries in this area, you're gonna perform a fast exam. Um, and if it's positive, a pericardial window, if there's blood, then you're gonna perform a sternotomy, you take the patient to the OR for a sternotomy. Um, a lot of times these patients, if they have a cardiac injury, will decompensate in front of you if they are not already, um, have not already coded prior to arriving to the trauma bay. If you lose signs of life in front of you, then it's going to require a resuscitative thoracotomy. Um, and then thoracodominal injuries start off with a laparotomy, evaluate whether there's a diaphragmatic violation. The uh, approaches, this is very high yield here. Um, this is common for them to present you with a diagnosis of an injury and they wanna know the operative approach. This is just rote memorization. Um, so for your right thoracotomy, you can access your right main stem bronchus, your left main stem bronchus, the trachea, the upper two thirds of your esophagus and your right hemidiaphragm. The left side is your left main stem bronchus, your descending aorta, your uh, lower one third of the esophagus and your left subclavian artery. A median sternotomy gets you the ascending aorta, your anominate artery and vein, your proximal right subclavian and proximal left common carotid artery and uh, the heart, obviously. The midclavicular incision with a medial clavicle resection is for your distal right subclavian artery. Moving on to the abdomen, uh, small bowel is the most common hollow viscous injured. Um, CT scans usually would show free fluid, no solid organ injury, bowel wall thickening, mesenteric stranding. Uh, this should be concerned for a hollow viscous injury. If you, if they have a, if they do not have peritonitis, you can do serial abdominal exams with a repeat uh, CT in eight to 12 hours. If they have peritonitis, they go straight to the OR. Um, if the injury is greater than 50% after debridement of non-viable edges, um, then you 
are going to perform a resection. If there are multiple enterotomies uh, in a row, you can do a large segment uh, resection. Mesenteric hematoma uh, can be explored if it's expanding or if it's greater than two centimeters. Uh, going to the colorectal portion, uh, if you have a right or transverse colon injury, these can be repaired primarily. Um, how, if you have greater than 50%, though, then you're going to resect this and do a primary anastomosis. The left colon, um, again, you have the option of primary repair versus resection. However, if, have, if they're in shock or have extensive gross contamination, you can temporize with an end colostomy. Um, or if you do a primary repair, you can do a diverting loop ileostomy. High rectal injuries, if it's intraperitoneal, uh, you can repair the defect and then divert them. Extraperitoneal, you're going to take them to the OR to divert them. Low rectal can sometimes be repaired transanally. For the liver, if you have, uh, if you've done your P's, you know, uh, Pringle pack, um, pressure, then in your stomach some bleeding, it's okay to ligate the common hepatic artery because there's collateral supply from the GDA. Um, the, you can always temporize and bring them back um, and to allow time for better resuscitation. If it's a retrohepatic IVC injury, um, you may need an atrocagal shunt. This is a very morbid injury. Um, Lacerations can be managed non-operatively. Uh, however, failure is defined by unstable vital signs requiring further resuscitation greater than four units of packed red blood cells, or if you have a repeat CT scan that shows an active flush. Common bowel duct injury follows along the same line of um, bowel injury following the 50% rule. So if it's greater than 50% circumference injury, then you're gonna perform a cholidocojejunostomy um, leave drains for this injury, regardless of how you repair it. Portal vein injury, if you have to ligate the portal vein, there's a 50% mortality rate associated with that. To gain access, you will have to transect the pancreas. For the spleen, uh, again, we had attempt not operative management, but if you have persistent instability, despite resuscitation for two units of packed red blood cells, then it's considered failed um, and need to take for a splenectomy. Remember they get uh, post splenectomy vaccines for H. flu meningococcal and pneumococcal, and they have a risk for post splenectomy sepsis up to two years after splenectomy. Going to the retroperitoneum, um, you have the duodenum, which uh, causes us all grief. Uh, if you have an injury to the duodenum and there's a perforation, you can do a primary repair or resection. However, it's in the second portion. You cannot resect this um, due to the ampulla uh, being in this area. So you would attempt a, a primary repair or do a jejunal serosal patch, do a pyloric exclusion, GJ anastomosis, wide drainage, um, and NG tube decompression. If there's a hematoma that's causing small bowel obstruction symptoms, this usually happens 12 to 72 hours after the injury. Um, a upper GI would show the stack of coins that's depicted here. And then you're going to do not, uh, not operative management NG tube and TPM for a couple of weeks uh, to allow for the hematoma to resolve. Um, the pancreas you're going to have findings on your CT of edema, necrosis, or uh, pancre peripancreatic fat. Uh, if you see a contusion in the OR, leave a drain in the uh, lesser sac. And then if you have a distal pancreatic duct injury, it's going to require a distal pancreatectomy. Um, the answer I've seen on a lot of questions is distal pancreatectomy, a spleen sparing distal pancreatectomy. Um, if the pancreatic head duct is injured, it's going to require wide drainage at your initial operation with a delayed Whipple. And then your retroperitoneal zones, uh, 
So if it's penetrating, all of them get explored. If it's blunt, zone one is always explored. Zone two is explored if expanding, and zone three is also explored if, if expanding. I'm going to skip the renal part here um, because it's not really much tested on that other than the anatomy of the positioning of the vein, artery, and pelvis. Uh, the ureteral injury is more commonly tested. So if it's a greater than two centimeter injury, depending on where it's at is what you do. So if it's the upper two thirds, you are gonna temporize this with a nephrostomy and tie off the ureteral ends. If it's greater than two centimeters and in the lower one third, you can attempt reimplantation onto the bladder, which may be assisted by psoas hitch or borari flap. If the injury is less than two centimeters, you try to mobilize the ends and anastomose them over a stent. Leave drains regardless of what you do for this. Um, and then most common post-operative complication is gonna be stricture due to your blood supply um, being violated. And then uh, for bladder injury, if it's extra peritoneal, then you just decompress with the um, with a Foley for a couple of weeks. Um, and then if it's intraperitoneal, you're going to take them to the OR and do a two layer closure and decompress with Foley. Extremity trauma, this is also rote memorization. Um, so these are your orthopedic injuries and their associated um, nerve and arterial injuries. This is something that I typically just memorize a couple of days beforehand. Um, and it helps with a couple of questions. Trauma and pregnancy. Um, so the main thing here is what's good for mom is good for baby. Um, so placental abruption, uh, you have a 50% fetal mortality rate. Uh, the way you test for this is this fancy person's fancy name uh, test. And it, what it does is assess for fetal blood in the paternal circulation. circulation. Um, and then uterine rupture, uh, it typically occurs in the posterior fundus of the uterus. Um, when do you do a C-section? So if you have persistent maternal shock and the gestational age is survivable, um, and, or if the patient is going into DIC, and um, additionally, if you have a life-threatening injury that is uh, unaccessible due to the gravid uterus. So critical care uh, for pulmonary, really what they want us to have in our back of our mind for pulmonary is this graph that we learned in the second year of med school. Um, so they typically test um, what decreases our FRC and what increases our FRC. So ARDS, atelectasis and contusions are gonna reduce your FRC and PEEP increases your FRC. Um, they sometimes ask about restrictive lung diseases and obstructive lung diseases and what the, um, what's high, what's low, what's normal, whenever it comes to the uh, spirometry. And that's again, just uh, rote memorization. And then uh, going back here, the other thing that they like to ask us to identify is ARDS. And we use the Berlin criteria. Typically, you're gonna the, one of the things that is gonna signify this is the PF ratio less than 300, and classifying it as mild, moderate, or severe. And then uh, how you treat that is by putting them on lung protective strategy, which is a low tidal volume, higher PEEP. So the six cc's per kg of ideal body weight is the tidal volume. All right. Moving on to cardiovascular, uh, this chart is high yield. There's usually around three or four questions um, that are derived from this chart. So it covers the physiologic derangements uh, based off what type of shock you have. The only thing that's not really covered in that chart is the SVO2. Um, just, I always remember what increases SVO2, therefore I remember, or what, sorry, what decreases SVO2, that way everything else should increase SVO2. So the things that decrease SVO2 is your low hemoglobin and cardiogenic shock. Um, the rest of them should have an increased SVO2. Uh, memorize the normal parameters so that 
sometimes whenever they ask these questions, they give you the answer options of actual values for the uh, physiologic parameters. And if you don't know normal, then it's gonna make the question more challenging. Um, more math in the heart. So you have the equation that they like to test is the carrying capacity, uh, oxygen carrying capacity. Just recognize that this uh, equation, the most important part here is hemoglobin. So if a patient's being persistently hypoxic, their hemoglobin, they may need a unit or two of blood to help uh, increase their oxygen carrying capacity. Um, and understand that the unloading of oxygen is affected by your hypercarbia fever and the 2G, or sorry, 2, 3, DGP and acidosis. Um, again, the cardiovascular drugs, so pressors are dobutamine, do, uh, dopa, dopamine, phenylephrine, norepi, and epi know what receptors they act on and what those receptors do. Um, there's usually a question that'll uh, give you a patient in cardiogenic shock and ask what drug would be most effective. And they would ask AXAT beta one, AXAT alpha one, AXAT alpha and beta, um, instead of just telling you the drug names. Uh, GI nutri and nutrition, uh, they love testing the respiratory quotient. Uh, it's been on every app site that I've taken. Uh, they usually test the protein oxidation and starvation, um, but definitely know uh, the, definitely know all five of these values because um, they're all easily testable and easy points to get. And then um, they also love testing the energy sources for your colonocytes and enterocytes. Again, easy points to gain on the app site. And then um, if you have a chyle leak, they're gonna need to be placed on a medium chain fatty acid diet. And then um, refeeding syndrome is also frequently tested on the app site. These are patients who are either alcoholics or malnourished of some, uh, some form. And, when you start refeeding them, you lose your FOS and then you can't, uh, because you're making all your ATP and then you can't make any more ATP and you go into respiratory distress. Renal, um, so just know your indications for hemodialysis. So AEIOU, acidosis, electrolytes, intoxication, fluid overload, uremia, um, and then your renal toxic drugs that we, um, uh, are usually, that we usually encounter on the test are aminoglycosides and vancomycin. If they ask a contrast question, the way to prevent contrast induced nephropathy is by prehydrating. And that's all I got. Alrighty, thanks so much. Um, so that was a fantastic overview, Jake. Really appreciate it. Uh, next, we will move on to um, our next topic, which is HPB with Dr. Doug Cassidy. Uh, Dr. Cassidy is from MGH, and we're lucky that he's going to be able to give this talk to us again. Um, all right. Okay, thank you all for having me. Uh, let me know if there's any issues with the slides uh, or with my sound. And if my children come in and interrupt me, I apologize in advance. Um, so I'm, I have the privilege of being able to talk about uh, HPB uh, for the, the third year, and I'll do my best to kind of you know move things through. There's a lot to cover. Um, so HPB is 10.5, about 10% of the app site. Um, and then the content that you're going to see here, I'll cover liver anatomy on a number of liver topics, you know, biliary system, and then finally uh, the pancreas. 
So starting with the liver, um, from an anatomical perspective, the liver is divided into a functional left and right lobe by Cantley's line, uh, which is a vertical plane which extends from the middle of the gallbladder fossa to the IVC. Sorry about that, just working on some technical problems right here. I'm not sure if my camera's showing up, but I'll continue with the slides. Um, so a vertical plane extends from the gallbladder fossa to the IVC. So then the hepatic veins then divide the liver into four sectors, uh, and the liver is divided into a total of nine functional segments. Now the right liver contains the segments five, six, seven, and eight. The left liver contains segments two, three, and four, four A and four B. Uh, the middle hepatic vein then divides segments eight and five uh, of the right lobe and segments four A and four B of the left lobe. The right lobe is split by the right hepatic vein into an anterior sector, um, uh, segments eight and five, and the posterior sector seven and six. The umbilical fissure divides the left lobe into a left lateral sector containing two and three, and the left medial sector containing four A and four B. The left hepatic vein bisects the left lateral segment, which is between segments two and three. Finally, the caudate lobe, um, segment one, drains directly into the retrohepatic IVC. An extended right hepatectomy would leave the left lateral segment whereas an extended left hepatectomy uh, leaves the right posterior segment. So this slide right here is just kind of a summary of all of those animations and as a reference for everybody um, when, if you want to re review the slides at another time. Looking at liver abscesses, uh, there's a number of different kinds that are often tested. The first being pyogenic abscesses, which commonly can just arise from direct spread from the biliary tree, such as in the patient with cholangitis, but also from hematogenous spread or from an adjacent organ infection. These patients present with fever, malaise, vague right upper quadrant pain. Uh, and what you see is that this is most commonly enteric bacteria, usually gram negative, such as E. coli as a causative organism. Um, you know, imaging demonstrates this central attenuating mass that you see here can sometimes be multi-loculated with some peripheral enhancement. Treatment is percutaneous drainage and then tailoring antibiotic therapy according to the bug uh, that grows. The second uh, you see here is an amoebic abscess. Uh, these are suspected with any recent travel to Central or South America, um, particularly within the equatorial regions. The causative agent is Entamoeba histolytica, and compared to the pyogenic abscesses, you don't get any organisms when the abscesses are sampled. Uh, so it's a, a sterile sample. Um, the uh, ent uh, Entamoeba histolytica is not found in any of the stool specimens of infected patients, uh, but there are diagnostic antibodies which are present in almost all patients. Uh, C the CT imaging shows this hypo-intense, hypo-attenuating rather lesion uh, with a peripheral enhancing edema, a uh, ring of enhancing edema there. As I said, there's no organisms on aspiration and the treatment is just a 10 day course, usually a flagell. You know, we usually we reserve drainage unless there's a super infection or a poor response to antibiotics. And then finally is the echinococcal, sorry, um, abscesses, which is uh, you know, also called hydrated disease. It's due to echinococcus, either granulosis or multilocularis. Uh, these are the patients who um, you, know, you, you don't want to spill this into the intra-abdominal cavity because of the risk for anaphylaxis. Uh, so treatment is albendazole uh, and then surgical excision or you know, the pair, the puncture aspiration injection, a scolicidal agent, uh, and re-aspiration. The key is just not spilling cyst contents. Another popular question are reviewing benign liver lesions, specifically the radiographic findings of these lesions. Uh, the most common lesion is a hemangioma, and the other is to review are focal nodular hyperplasia and uh, uh, hepatic adenomas. Um, 
So hemangiomas are often asymptomatic, the most common benign liver lesion. They have a very characteristic CT finding that you can see on the three phases there. Uh, so first, you know, there's peripheral enhancement on the arterial phase. This is followed by centripetal filling of contrast on the portal venous phase, and then retention of contrast on the delayed phase. Uh, most hemangiomas are benign, and we don't do anything for them. However, uh, there are life-threatening uh, consequences for large ones, either Cossaback Merritt syndrome, or thr thrombocytopenia, consumptive coagulopathy, or in the pediatric population, uh, these hemangiomas can cause a high output cardiac failure. Um, but for the most part, these are benign and they're left alone. The next lesion you see here are hepatic adenomas. These are well circumscribed lesions. They contain sheets of hepatocytes without any intervening biliary ductules or oral, or oral tracts, and they're associated with high estrogen states, such as pregnancy, OCP use, and steroid use. Uh, on imaging, these lesions appear heterogeneous. They can have a mixed fat hemorrhage content. Uh, they enhance on the arterial phase, but tend to be iso intense to the liver on portal and delayed phases. Since they don't contain these portal tracts and biliary ductules, they don't enhance with the administration of hepatobiliary contrast like EOVIST. Uh, and because of risk of malignant transformation, you know, after you remove the offending agent, those uh, hepatic adenomas that persist um, or those that are large enough are typically resected. And finally, focal nodular hyperplasia. Uh, there's no risk of malignant transformation for these lesions. They're due to hyperplastic growth of normal hepatocytes. Um, they typically are homogeneously enhanced in the arterial phase uh, and a central hypodensity, this area that's uh, suggestive of a central scar. Um, and uh, the mass becomes isotense to the liver in the portal phase. Central scar may enhance on delayed phases. And then when you give hepatobiliary contrast, like EOVIS, the lesion becomes hyperintense because of the abnormal bile ducts and slower biliary excretion compared to the surrounding liver. Also, you know, it's a hypotense central scar. So, for malignant liver lesions, you know, primary malignant tumors include hepatocellular carcinoma and an idiopathic cholangiocarcinoma. However, meds to the liver are far more common uh, than primary tumors. Uh, more than 75% of the primary malignant tumors are HCC, with cirrhosis of any etiology being uh, uh, kind of the underlying factor. Um, in the U.S., more cases of HCC are attributed to HCV than HPV. Over worldwide, chronic HPV infection is more common. Uh, At-risk patients get screening every 6 to 12 months, serial ultrasounds, as well as uh, alpha fetal protein level. Uh, and on axial imaging, you can see the lesion here that it's hypervascular with ar early arterial enhancement and a rapid washout. Uh, the choice of therapy and treatment for these is uh, individualized based on both the degree of the tumor as well as the underlying liver disease. Um, so the Barcelona Clinic uh, Liver Cancer Staging System is used to risk stratify these patients and typically we can resect these in patients uh, who have a resectable tumor and usually a child's a cirrhotic with enough functional liver reserve that they're not going to have uh, any dysfunction following uh, resection. However, uh, surgery is contraindicated if you have any extra hepatic metastases or bilobar tumors requiring resection without an adequate future liver remnant. Uh, so for patients who don't meet resection criteria, uh, there's a possibility for liver transplant. We use the Milan criteria to assess the suitability uh, for patients for liver transplant. So the criteria you should know is that it's a single lesion up to five centimeters up to three uh, lesions, each less than three centimeters, and no extra hepatic uh, metastatic disease or major vessel involved. Uh, and for patients who don't you know, meet that criteria, either for resection or for liver transplant, there are adjunct therapies that can be used, like transarterial chemoembolization uh, as a potential bridge to transplant, um, and then therapy for um, um, metastatic unresectable tumors like serafinib. Uh, and then for metastatic tumors, um, you know, these are more common than primary tumors, uh, and they can have a variable appearance uh, based on what the primary is. Uh, so neuroendocrine tumors and um, uh, real cell carcinoma are often hypervascular, whereas you know, the gastrointestinal adenocarcinomas can appear hypovascular. 
uh, and blood supply to the, these hepatic nets. It's usually via the hepatic artery. Uh, this table is just kind of a summary uh, of all of that uh, for your reference. You know, what these lesions look like on the non-con scan, arterial, portal, and venous phases. Uh, and then if you're interested in what they look like on MRI, uh, this table also kind of summarizes it as far as like the T1 uh, lesions are concerned in different phasing, so your arterial, portal, venous, and flame phasing. Then at the bottom, you have the administration of hepatobiliary contrast uh, and what the lesions look like. Another topic that can come up sometimes uh, is just portal hypertension and just liver failure. Um, you should be able to calculate you know, uh, or know the formula uh, to uh, determine you know, portal hypertension, which is a hepatic, it's a hepatic vein pressure gradient greater than or equal to five, uh, and you can use your increase in portal venous resistance. So this gradient is the difference between the wedge hepatic venous pressure and the free hepatic venous pressure. Uh, and when present, Develop portosystemic collaterals, form in sites like the esophagus, distal esophagus, and GD junction, uh, the rectum, peri umbilical region, uh, with recanalization of the umbilical vein. And then liver failure in general can be pre hepatic, intra hepatic, or post hepatic. And the intra hepatic causes can be kind of divided into pre sinusoidal, sinusoidal, and post sinusoidal. Um, you know, cirrhosis is the result of long standing uh, inflammation activation of the hepatic stellate cells in the perisinusoidal space. Uh, and complications of cirrhosis are variceal bleeding ascites, pyorenal syndrome, which all have come up you know, on various exams. Um, you should familiarize yourselves with the child's Pew score and both the MELD score. Uh, the child's Pew score is an assessment of the synthetic function of the liver. It's calculated with the albumin, bilirubin, prothrombin time, uh, and then clinical signs of liver decompensation, such as ascites and encephalopathy. Uh, whereas the MELD system classifies uh, liver disease severity and the purpose of liver transplant allocation based on serum INR, uh, creatinine and bilirubin, and uh, now often uses uh, sodium as well. Uh, and the MELD is a three month predicted survival for patients with cirrhosis. It lacks kind of the subjective parameters that the child's Pew score has. Um, keep in mind that for a safe functional liver remnant, 20 to 30 percent for patients with normal liver parenchyma, 30 to 40 percent for those who have steatosis or received chemotherapy, more than 40 percent for those who have underlying cirrhosis. Uh, moving on to the biliary system, so bile excretion or bile secretion, sorry, from the liver serves really two main functions, the excretion of toxins and metabolites from the liver and absorption of nutrients from the intestinal tract. Bile salts are produced from cholesterol, they form those primary bile salts, colic and uh, cannon deoxycholic acid, conjugated in the liver, dehydroxylated in the gut by bacteria uh, to form the secondary bile acids. So bile salts aid in the metabolism and absorption of fat. 95% of these are reabsorbed in the terminal ileum. Uh, and then another component of bile is bilirubin, which is you know, the breakdown of red blood cells. Um, bilirubin is conjugated in hepatocytes and excreted in the bile ducts majority being excreted in the stool. Uh, in addition to bile salts, the other components of bile are cholesterol and phospholipids. Uh, so this kind of you know graph on the upper right hand side um, shows kind of the different breakdown in when stones are more likely to form. Um, so what you want to have is a high percentage of bile acids, high percentage of the uh, um, phospholipids and a low percentage of cholesterol in order to prevent stone formation. And you can think about when this is disrupted, you know, stones are formed when you have increases either, um, you know, in uh, excess cholesterol or decrease in the bile salts or stasis. And with gar regarding biliary anatomy, just keep in mind that the common bile duct is anterior and lateral in the portal triad. Blood supply is purely arterial to it, runs at the three o'clock and nine o'clock positions and it's important not to devascularize the bile duct. Uh, you're supposed to approach it with a midline longitudinal incision. We'll talk about this a little bit more with bile duct injuries. Um, there's a lot of biliary pathology, benign biliary pathology that you know everyone should know, but I'll you know review a couple of the big stuff. 
um, this being biliary obstruction. It's most commonly due to gallstones, known as choleocolithiasis. Uh, it causes an increased risk of infection and cholangitis. Uh, and we know that ERCP is both diagnostic and therapeutic when there's a high level of suspicion, uh, which you can see it on the table on the upper right. Um, so preoperative ERCP for clearance is performed when there's a high likelihood. Uh, it's a highly effective, um, but it's not the only method for clearing stones. You know, it, if it's unclear, MRCP is also a highly sensitive and specific method uh, for looking at the um, biliary anatomy as well. Um, cholangitis, and we know is, you know, the triad, Charcot's triad of fever right for quadrant pain and jaundice. Uh, and then Reynolds pentad is the addition of hypotension and altered, altered mental status. Uh, and for these patients, you know, early IV hydration, antibiotics, you know, and urgent um, ERCP for decompression of the bile duct is the procedure of choice. For managing common bile duct stones, I think of it as a step up approach. Um, you know, one, you could do an ERCP, but if you're in the OR and you're doing an intraoperative cholangiogram, uh, there are a couple things you can start with that are relatively simple. Just a saline flush administration of glucagon in order to try to relax the sphincter of OD. Uh, and then if the uh, cystic duct is amenable to it, uh, you can do a transcystic common bile duct exploration. Um, so one, you need a cystic duct that's not small and friable. It needs to be, you know, you need to be able to dilate it. Uh, but other, you know, contraindications to doing this are if you have numerous stones or large stones, they're just not going to be able to be removed um, through a transcystic approach. If a transcystic approach fails, then the next step up would be to do a choidocotomy and common bile duct exploration, which could be done, you know, both laparoscopically if you have the ability to do so or an open technique. Uh, so as mentioned before, we don't do a transverse incision. This is a longitudinal incision to avoid devascularizing the bile duct. Um, you can always leave a T-tube in place um, to allow for future instrumentation. If for some reason you're unable to clear the duct um, uh, through this um, method. Uh, and then, you know, there are other, other ways you can go a transduodenal approach, but it's highly morbid. Uh, and for the most part, you know, it's not something that's performed anymore. Um, so really just think about it from a step-up approach, transcystic, then um, uh, cholidocotomy and common bile duct exploration, which you can see here, both of these images. So moving the bile duct injury, something we all hope to never be involved with, but um, very important to know how to manage and something that does come up pretty much every year. Um, the first part is the critical view of safety, uh, which there are three components of. You know, the pedocystic triangle is the, you know, needs to be visualized. Um, it's the inferior border of the liver uh, as its superior border, the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct completing the triangle. It needs to be cleared of fat and fibrous tissue. Second, the lower third of the gallbladder is separated from the liver bed. Uh, and finally, we see two and only two structures seen entering uh, the gallbladder. Despite this and uh, achieving the critical view, there's still about a 0.3% rate of common bile duct injury with lac coli. Uh, and the reason for it is inadequate visualization, usually from excessive cephalad retraction. Uh, bile duct complications can include uh, lacerations, transections, uh, surgical clips in the wrong spot, retained stones. Um, you can develop a painful biloma or bilious ascites. Uh, bile duct transections or leaks uh, typically don't prevent biliary drainage, uh, but do cause an elevation in bile absorption and elevations in total serum bilirubin levels. Uh, whereas misplaced clips or strictures can cause more of an obstructive jaundice pathology. Uh, so abdominal ultrasound is the first study of choice Follow by any additional imaging to define the biliary anatomy, whether that's a, a CT uh, or an MRCP. If it's identified immediately and you have the skill set, you can convert to an open procedure and repair can be accomplished. Uh, you know, keep in mind you want to know how much of the duct is, deva is devascularized or transected uh, and make sure that you're doing an appropriate repair. Uh, in addition, if it's totally reasonable to place drains and transfer a patient to a, a hepatobiliary center uh, if you don't have the ability to manage the injury. If the injury is not recognized until the post-operative course, 
And the ultimate goal is to control sepsis and biliary drainage with delayed reconstruction. So drains can be placed in uh, collections uh, that are formed and biliary drainage can be controlled either proximally with a percutaneous transpatic cholangiogram or cholangiography and tube placement, uh, or distally via an ERCP and potential stent placement, depending upon the injury. Uh, but for the most part, PTC is diagnostic and the therapeutic measure allows you to find the anatomy and then allow for delayed reconstruction with a biliary enteric anastomosis, which is most commonly a, a hepaticojejunostomy. Uh, so regarding bile duct injury, um, this is classified by the bismuth Strasburg classification. Uh, the ones really of note here, uh, a type A leak, is a leak from the cystic duct stump or duct of Lushka, which is treated with an ERCP and stent placement, which one will exclude a cystic duct leak or create a path of least resistance uh, to allow and facilitate building air drainage through the common bile duct. Uh, B is an occlusion of an aberrant right hepatic. C is transection without ligation of that aberrant right hepatic duct. D is a lateral injury to a major duct. Uh, and then E is complete disruption of the biliary enteric continuity due to transection excision or ligation. And a lot of these all require you know, a hepaticojejunostomy uh, or being able to bring both ducts down, you know, whether it's you know, a single or two anastomoses. Some additional benign biliary pathologies, uh, just to be aware of biliary dyskinesia requires a CCK simulated HIDA scan. You get kind of a picture of biliary colic um, uh, with these patients, but could be in the absence of stones. And what you see and what's diagnostic is a diminished gallbladder ejection fraction. Treatment is a cholecystectomy. Gall gallstone ileus is a mechanical obstruction, not an ileus, but a true obstruction uh, from a gallstone after fistulization and creation of a cholecystoduodenal or cholecystoenteric fistula. What you get is Riggler's triad. Uh, this image is from Riggler's original paper. You can see how old that x ray is. Uh, but it's evidence of intestinal obstruction, pneumobilia uh, from the fistula, uh, with the connection with the GI tract, and aberrant gallstone -like location, usually calcified stone in the right lower quadrant. And the treatment of choice is, is just a longitudinal enterotomy and enterolithotomy. You want to milk the stone uh, backwards to healthy bowel, remove it, and then close transversely. And then you should know management of gallbladder adenomas, uh, polyps greater than 10 millimeters, you know do a cholecystectomy on polyps of any size in the presence of stones, you know, get a cholecystectomy as well as polyps uh, and um, uh, primary sclerosis and cholangitis. Smaller polyps in the absence of stones can just be monitored uh, with serial ultrasounds. Uh, and then uh, just to know some stuff about cholangiocarcinomas and gallbladder cancer, uh, there's three distinct types of cholangiocarcinomas with different treatments. Uh, based on the location, whether they're intrahepatic, perihylar, uh, also known as classic tumors, and, or distally. Uh, and then the perihylar ones you know, are classified by the business correlate classification you see on the right. You know, the key um, for these uh, is that you, know, you need to have clear margins, um, and then you have to perform you know, a, bile to, uh, to, you know, a biliary enteric reconstruction. For gallbladder cancer, it's important to know uh, the size of the tumor, or sorry, the invasion of the tumor. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, a lot of the questions stem from uh, a post-operative patient, uh, a case whose pathology comes back. Uh, for T1A tumors, which means, you know, that they're, uh, you know, extending into the connective tissue, into the lamina propria, but don't invade uh, the muscle layer. Uh, these are patients that are fine with just a cholecystectomy. They don't go beyond the lamina propria. But T1B or greater, these patients need an extended cholecystectomy. That means resections of segments, uh, portions of 4B and uh, 5 of the liver uh, with good margins. You need to do a portal lymphadenectomy. Uh, and if the cystic, cystic duct is involved, you need a negative margin and a possible reconstruction. A lot of these tumors tend to be more in the fundus, so you don't have to worry about that, but it's definitely a possibility. Uh, and then just know that port site, you know, resection or excision is not indicated at all. And then finally, moving on to the pancreas, just real briefly, the anatomy and uh, the physiology. Um, for pancreas divism, it's a failure of fusion of the ventral and dorsal pancreatic ducts, uh, which can be a cause of, uh, of pancreatitis. Um, however, just keep in mind, 60% uh, of the population has normal anatomy, 
uh, with a patent accessory duct. 30% have an involuted accessory duct. 10% divism, but not all of that group of 10% has symptoms. Uh, but if they are symptomatic, you know, an MRCB can be used for diagnosis, and a minor capella sphincterotomy can be the treatment of choice. Annular pancreas can cause, you know, an obstruction that would present early on, you know, in the pediatric population. Uh, looks very similar to kind of, you know, the, the double bubble you'd expect, you know, for a duodenal atresia as well. Uh, and it's a duodenal bypass and do not resect um, the obstructing segment uh, because you can cause a, a pancreatic leak in the fistula. And then from a physiology perspective, uh, secretin and VIP stimulate bicarb secretion, uh, which acts on the uh, CFTR uh, receptor. Um, and CCK can potentiate secretin. Bicarb secretion varies inversely with chloride secretion. And the sum of the anions must equal the sum of the cations. So acute pancreatitis um, comes up a lot, uh, especially you know, getting into necrotizing pancreatitis and the complications of pancreatitis. Uh, most common causes are gallstones and then excessive alcohol use, but others can include post-ERCP, post-traumatic, anatomic abnormalities, idiopathic, uh, and complications when they're present are defined by the type of pancreatitis. Um, so you know, most cases are uh, interstitial, acute interstitial edematous pancreatitis, characterized by acute inflammation uh, of the pancreas and peripancreatic parenchymal enhancement, whereas 20% of patients can develop pancreatic necrosis. Uh, and then you have to look at the time frame of the complications as well. Um, the revised Atlanta classification kind of goes over this uh, and the management of all of these is different and that's why it's important to be able to define this. Um, just skipping to the next slide to look at these. Okay, you have these two types of pancreatitis. Uh, and once the type of pancreatitis is confirmed, local complications defined by the duration of onset. Okay, so for instance, in acute interstitial edematous pancreatitis, you know, fluid collections are less than four weeks. Okay, and these are acute peripancreatic fluid collections. Whereas if it's greater than four weeks, what happens? is the fluid becomes encapsulated, well circumscribed, and this is termed a pancreatic pseudocyst. In necrotizing pancreatitis, it's less than four weeks. This is an acute necrotic collection. And similarly, after four weeks, if this becomes walled off, and it's allowed to mature and demarcate the process. And this is where your step-up therapy comes into play. It's just to backtrack a little bit. You know, those pancreatic pseudocysts, just keep in mind, a lot of these will resolve on their own. Um, but if they don't resolve, one, you can consider an ERCP to see if there's any communication with the main duct or if there's a stricture. Uh, but the treatment of choice is internal drainage. This is when the anatomy is really important. If it abuts the stomach, you can consider an endoscopic cystgastrostomy. Otherwise, you really have to think about a surgical technique. And internal drainage is always preferred to external drainage. And then for pancreatic necrosis, uh, you know, the answer of choice is step-up therapy, which is percutaneous drainage, upsizing of drains to facilitate drainage, uh, and then really getting to a point where you could debride these through, you know, uh, a video-assisted retroperitoneal uh, pancreatic debridement um, in order to kind of clear out um, the necrotic material. You know, an open you know, necrosectomy is not the answer of choice these days. So for chronic pancreatitis, um, this is caused by irreversible and progressive destruction of the pancreas, most commonly due to excessive alcohol use. Uh, but there are other causes uh, such as autoimmune disorders, mutations in the trypsinogen gene, PRSS1, the cystic fibrosis gene, CFTR, and the protease inhibitor, SPINK1. Uh, other causes can you know, be due to outflow obstruction from trauma or pancreas divism. Uh, but imaging uh, can help define the duct uh, no areas with calcifications, areas of inflammation, suspicious areas for neoplasia. Surgery is indicated for pain and intractable pain, but also address complications such as pseudocysts, pancreatic ascites, obstructions, potential neoplasia. The operation of choice is tailored to the individual anatomical circumstances. Uh, so if there's ductal dilatation or a dominant inflammatory mass, you have to, you have to address this. There are purely decompressive options, such as a Pusteau, which is a lateral root wide pancreatic ojejunostomy. Uh, there's purely resection-based operations, like a Whipple, 
uh, like a duodenal preserving pancreatic head resection or the BAGAR procedure for isolated head and uncinant disease without upstream ductal dilatation. Um, and then there is, you know, for you know, isolated distal pathology, you can do a distal pancreatectomy. Uh, and then there's combination procedures, especially the Frey, uh, Frey procedure, which can be uh, kind of a combo of coring out the pancreatic head, as well as that longitudinal room wide pancreatic jejunostomy, uh, which allows for a resection of the an evolved you know, head of the pancreas, but also if there's ductal dilatation, you know, as a decompressive maneuver. Cystic lesions of the pancreas come up quite a bit. Uh, it's important to be able to distinguish cystic neoplasms and non-neoplastic cysts because the management is different. Um, a lot of these are incidentally seen on cross-sectional imaging. So if there's any confusion about the etiology, consider an EUS and fluid sampling. First of these is the uh, serocystic neoplasms. They're generally benign, found in older patients. This is the quote, unquote, grandmother um, demographic. A lot of these are more common in women. And you have these, the grandmother, mother, and daughter that you see here in the features uh, section. Um, these are well circumscribed uh, uh, cysts. They have a septae. Uh, they have a starburst part pattern, uh, often with a central scar. It can be calcified, sometimes a honeycomb appearance. There's no continuity with the duct, low serum amylase as a result, low CAA, absence of mucin. There's no need to resect these unless they're symptomatic. Mucin and cystic neoplasms is the mother uh, group uh, in a demographic. Uh, they're mucin producing with ovarian type stroma. They're in the body and tail. They're considered pre-malignant, so these need to be resected. Uh, if you sample these, there's gonna be an elevated CEA level, positive mucin. Next is the pseudo solid pseudopapillary tumor, uh, which is seen in younger women uh, with you know, uh, a mixed heterogeneous solid cystic uh, mass with necrosis, circumscribed cystic appearing capsule that's often internally calcified. And then pseudocysts are non-neoplastic. We talked about these, you know, their interventions are reserved for symptomatic and non-resolving. Uh, and then IPMNs, you know, we'll review in the next slide briefly. These are introductal papillary mucis, neoplasms, they produce mucin. Uh, they follow the dysplasia to invasive carcinoma sequence. They're hypoattenuating cystic masses that can cause ductal dilatation. Uh, and um, you, know, you have to understand the, uh, the high-risk stigmata uh, that can be present and worrisome features of these. Um, so prior consensus guidelines are referred to as the Sendai criteria. It's evolved into the Yukoka uh, consensus guidelines in 2012 and then I think most recently in 2017. Uh, but pretty much in general, uh, at least for the exam, you can resect all main duct IPMNs and all IPMNs with high risk stigmata. Uh, so the high risk stigmata, you know, are these enhancing solid components, main duct greater than 10 or clinical obstructive jaundice. Um, and then worrisome features need EUS and FNA to risk stratify. Uh, but you can see the worrisome features here, large cysts, um, main duct that's five to nine millimeters and enhancing neural nodule, which you can see on the bottom right. Uh, as well as kind of this, this kind of pathway for diagnostic workup when you go to the OR, um, you know, when you need further imaging to risk stratify whether you can follow these or if they're good operative candidates, usually just, you know, resecting it if there's worrisome features. Uh, PDACs, uh, you know, are, can be linked to cigarette smoking, but other risk factors can include diabetes, obesity, chronic pancreatitis, and lots of genetic risk factors such as Putiager, familial pancreatitis and Lynch syndrome. Uh, the pathogenesis is the adenoma carcinoma sequence and the majority of these tumors have a KRAS mutation. Presentation depends on the location, whether it's in the, body, the head pancreas versus the body or tail. Uh, if it's in the head, you worry about uh, obstruction, the intrapancreatic portion, the bile duct. Uh, and a CT pancreas protocol or MRCP or MRI and MRCP is the most common cross-sectional imaging. EUS with ultrasound and ERCP with brushing can obtain tissue diagnosis, especially if the chemotherapy is needed as a first-line treatment. However, you don't always need a tissue diagnosis prior to a plan for section. Types of operation depends on the location. Uh, I don't have all the steps here, but I would familiarize yourself with the Whipple procedure uh, because it does come up quite a bit as far as you know key steps, uh, such as you know when you have enough of a cocorization of duodenum, your landmarks, you know, how you manage the GDA and assessing flow, uh, make sure there's adequate flow to the liver. So just something to familiarize yourselves with. Uh, the complications are also important to know. 
um, you know, to leak gastric emptying, pancreatic fistula leak, and being able to identify, di identify a GDA bleed and, and pseudoaneurysm, uh, as well as the potential palliative therapies as well. Uh, and finally, neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas. Um, you know, the majority are non-functional. Um, they appear hypervascular and a lot present with metastatic disease to the liver. Uh, however, you can do a complete resection. There's a role for metastectomy. Um, so these, the non-functionals are most common, uh, but more fun are the functional ones, at least from a testing perspective. Um, and, you know, I think of these, you know, as another step-up approach in order to localize them and find them. Start with axial imaging, such as a um, pancreas protocol, uh, triphasic CT, uh, or an MRI. Um, you can then move on to somatostat receptor scintigraphy. Uh, there's no receptors for insulinomas. It's not entirely uh, true, but you know, there are less receptors. Uh, you can also do uh, a gallium uh, 68 dotate PET CT, uh, which is another form of somatostat receptor uh, functional imaging with better spatial resolution compared to the scintigraphy. Uh, then you can do an EUS um, a potential biopsy and then uh, selective visceral angiography. And there's five functional peanuts and just familiarize yourselves with the presentation of these. Insulinomas are most common, characterized by Whipple's triad, the neuroglycopenic symptoms, hypoglycemia, and relief with glucose administration. The majority of these are benign. The labs you're looking for is an elevated insulin uh, and C-peptide level or an elevated insulin to glucose ratio. And you can usually enucleate these. Gastronomas are the second most common, uh, but most common functional tumor in MEN1. They're located in Pissarro's triangle formed by the CBD cystic duct junction, D2, D3 junction, uh, and the pancreatic neck body junction. Um, and this is refractory peptic ulcer disease, diarrhea, and diagnosis with a serum gastrum level greater than 1,000 or a paradoxal increase greater than 200 with secretin administration. You can enucleate these if they're smaller in the duodenal mucosa, otherwise a formal resection is needed. The last three are more often malignant and you need formal resection for these. Uh, a glucagonoma is characterized by the four Ds, dermatitis, which is necrolytic migratory erythema, diabetes, depression, uh, and DVT, and most commonly in the uh, tail of the pancreas with elevated glucagon levels. VIP, OMA, is also known as WDHA or Werner Morrison syndrome, such as watery diarrhea, hypokalemia, and achloridia. Uh, this is more likely malignant, it's a high volume diarrhea with elevated VIP levels. And then somatostatinomas are rare. They're, character, they're in the head of the pancreas and they're characterized by diabetes, colothiasis, and steatorrhea. Um, that's all I have. Uh, good luck to everybody this year. Um, and just as an own personal plug, um, it's a little YouTube channel of mine with some educational videos that you might find helpful for your studying. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Cassidy, for that great review. Um, and last but not least, we're going to move on to our final topic. We have Dr. Susie Hill from Albany Medical Center, and she'll be reviewing uh, both hernias as well as upper and lower GI. So the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Let me just full screen this. All right, we'll move on. Um, we're taking a bit of a whirlwind tour through everything, but I'm um, just going to cover some kind of higher yield information. So in terms of GERD, you really want to think about doing a thorough workup, looking at esophageal manometry to look to see if there's any kind of lower esophageal sphincter dysfunction. Um, in addition, you want to do a 24-hour pH study. Sorry. Um, or you can do an impedance study if you're concerned for some kind of bile gastritis, an EGD to evaluate for the presence of, say, a hiatal hernia, which a barium swallow will also help you tell. Uh, medical management includes diet modification, H2 blockers, and PPIs. In terms of anti-reflux surgery, like I said, you have to assess for a hiatal hernia and reduce that if that's present. You must mobilize about four centimeters of intra-abdominal esophagus. Um, often tested, rarely done. You could do a callus gastroplasty for more length if needed. Reapproximation of your diaphragmatic cura, posterior to the esophagus with non-absorbable suture, and creation of a fundoplication of which there are multiple types. 
Um, moving on to esophageal dysmotility, um, kind of the three most common ones that you'll be tested on are achalasia, diffuse esophageal spasm, and nutcracker esophagus. Achalasia is rare overall, but it is the most common esophageal dysmotility disorder, presents with dysphagia, regurgitation. Uh, what you see is this classic failure of the LES to relax. You see how this tone never goes down. And then everyone has seen the classic bird beak contrast esophagram. Um, you can see a peristalsis on manometry as well as the increased LES pressure. Medical and treatment includes nitrates and calcium channel blockers. These usually only provide temporary relief. You can also try doing pneumatic dilation, uh, POEM, which is per oral endoscopic myotomy, or conversely, your surgical option is a Heller myotomy. Diffuse esophageal spasm. These patients tend to have this very classic corkscrew appearance on their barium swallow. They really present with non-cardiac chest pain, uh, sometimes a globus sensation or dysphagia. You really see these kind of very strong, uncoordinated, non-peristaltic waves and a lot of premature contractions. Uh, once again, kind of you can do medical therapy, but it's minimally effective. And then uh, your surgical treatment would be a modified Bell C Mark IV, um, but it can also not be very helpful. Um, nutcracker esophagus, pain is going to be your most common symptom. Um, barium is usually normal. Oops, sorry. Um, but you can have a corkscrew appearance. You see these really high amplitude contractions or conversely really long swallows uh, in the surgical treatment would be a long thoracic myotomy. In terms of esophageal cancer, there's two types. You have squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma. Squamous cell tends to be in your upper to mid esophagus. Risk factors include alcohol and tobacco. This really has a propensity for submucosal spread. Pretty much all of these patients should get neoadjuvant therapy with cislatin um, base. And then adenocarcinoma tends to be in the mid to lower esophagus. Two thirds of patients will present with resectable disease. Um, and um, surgical treatment, if it's a T um, tumor in situ or a T1A, meaning just involving mucosa, you can generally get away with uh, some kind of ablative therapy. T1B is surgery first, and T2 or N1 disease is neoadjuvant chemo radiation. Staging is the same for both. You know, these patients should all get a whole body PET CT, uh, EGD with biopsy and an endoscopic ultrasound to evaluate for lymph nodes. Um, when you're making your um, Sockectomy and your uh, kind of your gastric conduit, your right gastroepiploic artery is going to be your main blood supply. This is commonly tested. Uh, there's three main types of esophagectomies. You have transhiatal Ivor Lewis and three hole and on block. Kind of the incisions and limitations are listed below. The big things to be aware of is transhiatal because the incisions are in the neck and the abdomen. You really have a very limited lymph node dissection in the chest versus Ivor Lewis because your anastomosis is in your chest. These patients get sicker if they leak and then three hole on block, you have the best lymph node yield um, and kind of the best visualization, but this does have the highest leak and morbidity rate. Moving on to peptic ulcer disease, diagnosis is going to be with EGD, H. pylori testing, and fasting gastrin levels. Uh, treatment is going to be if they're H. pylori positive with triple therapy, PPI, flagell, and chlorothromycin. Um, PPI, sometimes it gets tested. What's their mechanism? And basically, it inhibits your HK ATPase and parietal cells. This prevents um, uh, acid release. Gastric ulcers greater than three centimeters may harbor cancer, so these really need biopsy. And then this is often tested as well as kind of the different types of uh, gastric ulcers. Type one is going to be on your lesser curve. Type two is easy to remember. It's two, so it's combined gastric and duodenal. Type three is prepyloric, and both of these are due to acid hypersecretion. Type four is juxtaesophageal, meaning near the LES. And type five is drug-related, usually NSAIDs, and this can be anywhere. Surgery is fairly less common these days uh, due to the advent of PPIs, but really, uh, in general, you can do a gastric red resection. Um, sometimes you do a grand patch, meaning that you close or um, just patch it with omentum. You can do a towel patch, bringing up a jejunum. If you have a bleeding duodenal ulcer, you worry about your gastroduodenal artery being involved. This would be a three-point ligation at 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and 6 o'clock, and really, um, Vagotomy and drainage should only be done in a stable patient. Moving on to gastric cancer, uh, it's actually quite complex. <laughs> um, in workup is the same EGD, biopsy, EUS, and PET-CT. Seward is basically the classification you have for cancers that are around the GEJ, broken up into one, two, and three with the cutoffs, as you can see, which basically decides whether or not the patient benefits from an esophagectomy, doing a gastrectomy, or a subtotal gastrectomy. And then also, as you can see from this figure here, um, looking at you know whether or not you're including distal esophagus in your 
specimen, um, kind of in the mid portion of the stomach doing a total gastrectomy. And then if it's in the distal part in the antrum, you can do a subtotal gastrectomy. And then just two quick trials to mention, the MAGIC trial and the CLASSIC trial, MAGIC showing progression-free and overall survival benefit to doing perioperative epirubicin 5-FU and cisplatin, and CLASSIC basically showing that even after curative R0 resection and D2 lymph node dissection, um, adjuvant KPOX shows improved outcomes. And then NCCN doesn't actually give formal uh, margin guidelines in general, kind of most societies seem to see around five centimeters, uh, but they do recommend an R0 resection and greater than or equal to 15 lymph nodes which is important to remember. Moving on to GIST, um, your EGD is really generally going to show a submucosal mass. You would can do an EUS. You really would only do an FNA if you think that you need to give neoadjuvant therapy, in which case you need tissue diagnosis, and then a CT abdomen pelvis. Uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy is usually a matinib, and neoadjuvant really, if downsizing, will facilitate having negative margins. And you really assess the tumor response with CT. And the tumor is really not going to shrink. The character of the tumor is going to change. So it's going to go from a heterogeneous hypervascular um, appearance to kind of more homogeneous hypo attenuating and cystic. And patients that are at high risk for recurrence really should get adjuvant imatinib. Um, you can see this really lovely nomogram from um, MSK. It kind of gives you an idea of risk uh, or sorry, recurrence-free survival. Your most common sites of metastasis are gonna be your liver and peritoneum. And your three major factors predicting metastatic disease, sorry about that, are tumor origin, size, and mitotic rate. Once again, an R0 resection, often you can do a wedge, and there's a very low incidence of nodal mets, so you don't often have to do a lymphadenectomy as opposed to with gastric cancer. Moving on to lower GI, so diverticulosis is false diverticula, as I think we all know, only the mucosa protrudes. These are often asymptomatic, but about 20% of patients can have diverticulitis and 15% of patients can have diverticular bleeding. These don't tend to overlap. Um, your big management principles in diverticulitis are broad spectrum antibiotics. Surgery is now really thought to be an individualized patient decision, where the first attack is usually the worst. You would perform a sigmoid colectomy, taking to the upper rectum where the tinea disappear. And also it's important to keep in mind there are fairly low colostomy reversals rates. So you really want to try to do a sigmoid colectomy with primary anastomosis and then a diverting loop ileostomy proximally if you're concerned about your anastomosis. And really everyone after a diverticulitis attack, whether or not they get surgery, needs a colonoscopy about six weeks post-attack to rule out cancer. Um, these are the Hinchy classifications being pericolonic or mesenteric or in the pelvis, um, purulent peritonitis, and then fecal lymph peritonitis. And then also diverticular disease can fistulize to a variety of different organs. And that counts as complicated disease. Moving on to lower GI bleed, about 60% of these are due to diverticulosis. And these actually have a really high rate of stopping spontaneously um, and about 25% re-bleed. Other big causes to be aware of include angiodysplasias, which are most commonly in the right colon. And they have a really high re-bleed rate of 80% ischemic colitis, which is usually secondary to some kind of reperfusion injury, neoplasia, which is a fairly low um, percent of lower GI bleed, um, sequel right-sided bleeding can present more occultly, and then left-sided or rectal tends to be more overt bleeding, uh, hemorrhoids, obviously you want to rule out an upper GI bleed, uh, especially if it's brisk, can look like a lower GI bleed, and inflammatory bowel disease. Um, like I talked about, in terms of workup, you want to rule an upper GI source first, and then this is often tested as well, kind of the different rates of um, picking up things. So using a um, technetium nuclear med test is kind of the best um, in terms of picking up lower rates of bleeding. So this picks up 0.1 to 0.5, a CTA picks up 0.3 to 1, and angio picks up 0.5 to 1.5. The advantage of angio and then obviously colonoscopy being that you can um, both have diagnostic and therapeutic measures. And your indication for surgery is really if you're needing to transfuse greater than six units of PRBCs in 24 hours. In resection, ideally you've localized the bleeding and you're doing a select mental colectomy because patients in general have very poor outcomes with total abdominal colectomy. Um, talking quickly about volvulus, two main types, sigmoid and cecal. Sigmoid volvulus patients tend to be older. You get this narrowing of the mesenteric pedicle and the mesenteric pedicle for the sigmoid would obviously be down here. And what happens is it elongates and then twists. Um, endoscopic detorsion is good initial management, but about 40% of these patients will recur. And um, these should all get a sigmoid colectomy. And if they're really sick, then a Hartman's.
Uh, sequel volvulus tends to be people that are younger. It's thought to be due to a failure of retroperitonealization of the cecum. Once again, the way I remember this is the mesenteric for the cecum is down here, so it twists this way. And endoscopic detorsion is often not helpful. It's a very low success rate. It's you know quite far to get to the cecum with an unprepped bowel. And in addition, it also has higher rates of ischemia. So these patients will, should really all go to the operating room and get a right hemicolectomy with primary anastomosis. Really quickly talking about inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, most of this is here for your reference, uh, but big things to keep in mind is Crohn's disease involves the entire GI tract, most commonly in the terminal ileum, and you really have these skip lesions. Your uh, path is really gonna be transmural, which is what results in fissures and fistulas. Um, kind of now with the age of steroids and biologics, we are doing hopefully less Crohn's surgery than we used to before, but really it's not curative for Crohn's disease, so it should really only be saved for acute complications. And you're really resecting to grossly negative margins. Um, ulcerative colitis involves the rectum and you get this proximal and contiguous spread, and that's really only involving the mucosal layer. Uh, definitive management is gonna be a total proctocolectomy and iliopouch anastomosis. Um, toxic megacolon is an indication for surgery, failure to thrive. Um, the big thing that often gets tested and is also good to know is that there are a variety of extra intestinal diseases for both um, inflammatory bowel diseases, but the big thing to know is that uh, no improvement with surgery for uh, primary sclerosing cholangitis or ankylosing spondylitis. Moving on to colon cancer, workup includes biopsy of your primary lesion, a colonoscopy to rule out synchronous lesions, a chest, abdomen, pelvis, and a chest x-ray and serum CEA. Resection principles include ligating at your vessel takeoff. You need 12 nodes. And then, um, you know, if you see a polyp that harbors cancer, when is a polypectomy adequate? It's if you have a T1 lesion, at least a three millimeter margin and kind of no high risk features like neuro or lymphovascular invasion. Treatment principles, you can perform isolated metastectomies. There is a survival benefit to this. Um, patients should get adjuvant fulfox if they're stage three or four. There's really no indication for um, radiotherapy. Another important thing to remember is that if patients are KRAS wild type, you can use a VEGF inhibitor or an EGFR inhibitor. And these people should really be surveilled after their resection with yearly CEAs and colonoscopies. Um, these are the familial cancer syndromes. Once again, this is a very thorough. I'm just going to go over some quick points. Uh, they're both autosomal dominant diseases. FAP involves the APC tumor suppressor gene. These are predominantly left-sided. It has 100% penetrance, so the, meaning that 100% of patients with FAP will get colorectal cancer by 40 years old, and about 20% of these are de novo. Um, they're also more likely to get duodenal or periampulary adenocarcinomas and desmoids. And these patients should really all be getting TPC and at least ostomy or TPC with a pouch, and really your risk of um, cancer recurrence is going to be in the pouch. Moving on to Lynch syndrome, this is due to mismatch repair defects, and this is going to be MSH2 or MLH1. Um, these are predominantly right-sided. There is less penetrance, about 80% lifetime risk, and onset tends to be around 45, and it's an accelerated um, adenoma to carcinoma sequence. Certainly would look at and review the Amsterdam and Bethesda criteria in terms of diagnosis. The big other extracolonic diseases to be aware of are endometrial cancer and gastric cancer. So the treatment is a total abdominal colectomy with ileal rectal anastomosis, and um, female patients should really be getting a THBSO. This tumor also tends to be, their tumors also tend to be 5-FU resistant. Rectal cancer, your workup, you really want to use rigid proctoscopy. This is going to be your best for distance from anal verge, a colonoscopy to rule out synchronous lesions. MRI pelvis will allow you to evaluate your mesorectal fascia, sphincter involvement in tumor and um, node status. Uh, you want to do a CT chest abdomen pelvis to evaluate for any metastatic disease, as well as a CEA. Uh, the big difference in treatment principles is that most of these patients should really get neoadjuvant therapy and really all patients with stage two or three should. Uh, this consists of 5-FU, which is a radio sensitizer, as well as 50 grays to the pelvis. Uh, lower one third, which is thought of to be a zero to five centimeters and generally involving the sphincter complex, uh, these patients need an APR versus upper two thirds of five to 15 centimeters, and that is an LAR.
or low anterior resection. Transanal um, excision is okay if it's a T1 lesion, which is less than three centimeters, less than a third of the circumference, mobile and non-fixed, well differentiated, and then no concerning features. Once again, no neurolymphovascular invasion and no evidence of lymph node involvement. And these people all need to be surveilled very closely. And if they're presenting with obstructive rectal cancer, you know, this doesn't tend to be amenable to stenting like colon cancer can be. So they really should get some kind of diverting loop colostomy first. Really quickly to go over anal cancer, anal squamous cell cancer is an IGRA protocol, 5-FU, mitomycin, and radiation. Recurrent disease uh, is salvage, APR, or palliation. Um, but you know, radiation can take about six months to show effects. Uh, most commonly metastasizes to the lung and the liver, and your risk factors recurrence are larger size or more uh, circumference of the anal canal involved. AIN is a precursor lesion for SCC. These features should get high resolution anoscopy and local ablation. Anal melanoma, um, kind of the needle has shifted on this and the answer is more commonly thought to be wide local excision where historically the answer was APR. And the reason really is just to be less aggressive in these people who have uh, really aggressive disease. Um, Pagets is adenocarcinoma and the important thing to do is they need a colonoscopy to rule out colon adenocarcinoma as their source of Paget's anal cancer and Bowen's is cell in situ, and this is white local excision. Quickly to talk about hernias, I'm sure we're all familiar with the different types of hernias. You have ventral hernias, groin hernias, and then quickly uh, incisional hernias are about 20% of laparotomy incisions can result in incisional hernias, and really all port sites greater than 10 millimeters, the fascia should be closed. Um, ventral hernia repair principles, you want to think about weight loss, smoking cessation, glucose control, improved nutrition, less than two centimeters, uh, generally one can do a primary repair versus greater than two centimeters, you should do a mesh. Um, I think this is kind of the most intuitive diagram for looking at different types of mesh, whether it's overlay, inlay, uh, retrorectus, also known as sublay, preperitoneal known as underlay or intra-abdominal or IPOM. Uh, component separation requires a complete lysis of adhesions. And then what you do is you elevate lipocutaneous flaps two centimeters lateral to your linea semilunaris at the edge of your rectus. And this allows you to excise, or sorry, incise the external oblique fascia and really separate this plane right here between the external and the internal oblique. And then you incise one centimeter lateral to the linea alba. And this allows you to release the posterior rectus sheath and develop this out to the linea semilunaris. And this allows um, for free of uh, space to kind of close large hernia defects or loss of abdominal wall domain. Uh, and this is the um, amount of distance you get in each section. And then um, I just wanted to present this about inguinal hernias. I'm sure we've all done plenty of repairs, but you should be comfortable looking at what the anatomy looks like from an open view, as well as from a laparoscopic view, you know, uh, familiar with direct versus indirect hernias, um, where all the vasculature is. And then commonly quizzed is the most common injured nerve during open repair is going to be your ilioinguinal nerve. And you can see this distribution here, as opposed to during laparoscopic repair is the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. And you see this distribution here. All right, that is it for my slides. Thank you so much for your time. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hill. Um, let me get back up here. Perfect. And so awesome. So thanks everyone for these great talks. And um, I think we lost Dr. Edwards because he had to um, run off to probably go save some lives here. But um, the rest of us are available for some questions if there's any. I know Dr. Fong and I tried to answer some along the way. Um, and so I'll wait for a minute for any to roll in. Uh, but just so that everyone knows um, that this presentation is good uh, and the recording, so the slides and our recording um, from each of these presenters is gonna be posted on the SSAT website. Um, so we'll get that up, um, look out for an email um, for when the recording will be available. Um, give us a moment to um, make sure that it's in tip top shape for you all. Um, and we'll make sure that, that you have that. Um, and don't forget that next week we have uh, round two where we hit some of the other topics not covered for tonight. Um, and I just want to say special thanks to all three of our speakers, Dr. Edwards, Dr. Cassidy, and Dr. Hill for their time for coming out tonight um, for the SSAT, particularly the Resident and Fellows Education Committee who puts this on. 
Um, and importantly for uh, Dr. Motaz Kadan, who's our current chair, and Dr. Maria Altier, who's our upcoming chair. Um, and most important of all is um, LK Colin, who's our director of administration, who uh, fantastically put this all together because I would not know how to do webinars without her. Um, so awesome. Um, oh, and now we have a couple questions rolling in. Perfect. Um, what are the ED? Oh, we lost our trauma expert here, um, but we can probably field some people here. Oh, and Z has volunteered to answer questions. Z. You are up. I thought I was clicking on the typing the response button, but I guess like I'm answering this um, okay. on live. <laughs> but um, to, uh, to Darius' uh, question about stage two colon cancer with less than 12 notes, you are right in that you should be prescribing systemic therapy, which is chemotherapy, given that you are understaging the patient, but you wouldn't call it neoadjuvant therapy because at that point you would have gotten your operation. So technically it's adjuvant chemotherapy for anyone with less than 12 notes um, examined during your initial operation. And Dr. Sal is a colorectal expert, so she can check me on that. <laughs> no. Oh. Um. No, these the experts are sorry. I was checking, I'm reading the rest of the questions coming in. And so um, our second one coming up is what are the ED thoracotomy indications? Um, and so perfect. So for an ED thoracotomy, I can spitball here since we lost Dr. Edwards. Um, the best thing I think to review for looking at that is the East guidelines um, that are published. Um, and you have to think of it of, of penetrating versus blunt trauma. And so any penetrating uh, thoracic injury with traumatic arrest um, uh, kind of within uh, 15 minutes of the scene should be, you should be opening the chest. Um, and then for, for non-penetrating trauma, that's where like the East and the West kind of get a little dicey on the guidelines there. Um, but for, for blunt trauma, um, if, if the patient rolls into the bay and it has vital signs and then loses them in front of you, that is an indication, um, but otherwise kind of 10 minutes from the scene of loss of pulses is, um, is probably uh, one of the main ones used, but usually how they'll present it for the blunt trauma is that for someone who's lost um, pulses in front of you in the bay. Um, I don't know if any of the other panelists have, but I'd say the East guidelines are the main ones that I think they go by. I just pasted in a link to the East guidelines in the Q&A. Nice. All right. And I think that's all we got for now. Great. Thank you, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you all next week.